In this program, I'm going to try to show you all the fundamentals of golf shot making that I've learned and applied in my own game over the past 30 years. We'll begin with the full shots, looking first at the much neglected preliminaries to swinging the club, and then at the action itself, step by step. Next, we'll put it all together in slow motion with various angles and with different clubs, again concentrating on what I consider the key fundamentals of a fine golf swing. After that, we'll look at nine full shot factors that bear heavily on how well you play this game, with particular emphasis on controlling the flight of the ball. Next, we'll look at the basics of the short game, the scoring shots from wedge play right on through the putter. Finally, my lifelong teacher, Jack Grout, will join us to offer some thoughts on learning and improving at golf. Okay, let's go to work. the different shots in the game of golf, the rules allow 14 different clubs. But fortunately, you only have to learn basically one swing. When I started playing the game of golf, I had an instructor, Jack Grout, who believed that all golf shots should be played with one basic swing. He felt like the grip should be the same for all shots, the aim should be the same for all shots, the ball position should be the same for all shots. And the basic swing arc and plane should be the same for all shots. The only variables were the length of the shaft, the loft of the club, and whether the club face was closed at address or open at address to produce a draw or fade. Otherwise, the golf swing was the same throughout all clubs. Now let me show you the one basic golf swing from two different angles with four different clubs. The nine iron, the five iron, the two iron, and the driver. And you'll notice that the approach to the shot, the golf swing, the ball position, the arc of the swing, the plane of the swing is the same with all the clubs. The rhythm remains the same with all the clubs. The only thing that varies is that the stance is narrow with the nine iron and gets wider as we move to the five iron, the two iron, and the driver. The ball is further away as we move from the nine iron, the five iron, two iron to the driver. The swing becomes a little bit longer as the clubs progress, only because of the length of the shaft. But the golf swing and the approach to the shot remains exactly the same through all the clubs. And I think that's important in learning how to play the game of golf. When playing varying length shots and different types of shot, the average golfer has a tendency to want to change his swing for the shot. In other words, if he's got a short five iron shot, he takes a short swing. If he's got a long five iron shot, he takes a long hard swing. Not the same swing. I think that you should try to use the same exact golf swing for every shot. If you want to play a longer shot, hit a four iron. If you want to hit a shorter shot, hit a six iron. If you want to hit a shot right to left, close the face slightly. If you want to hit a shot left to right, open the club face slightly. Now, there's a million different things that you can do to play different shots, but basically, you want to use the same swing, the same approach with all shots. Make sure that the ball is in the proper position in the stance and the swing is the same Nice rhythmic golf swing with all shots. I think it'll help you. The grip is the simplest and easiest fundamental and also the most important fundamental in the game of golf. A good grip allows everything in the swing to happen naturally. What is a good grip? What are the elements of a good grip? Well, let's try to do as many things as natural as possible. First of all, let's let our hands hang at our sides. Now, as the left hand's hanging to, down at my side, that's where I want the club to fit, just where the left hand, the way the left hand hangs. My right hand, as it's hanging to my side naturally, I just bring it up 
as though I was shaking hands with somebody, and I put it on the golf club. That puts both hands on the club in a reasonably straight fashion. Whether you use an interlocking grip, an overlocking grip, or a full finger grip, I don't really think it make, makes much difference. It's a matter of personal comfort on how you connect your hands. Now, the left hand is the strength of the golf grip. It has to be the support. So the golf club passes diagonally across the palm of the left hand. If you were going to hit somebody, let's just say with the back of your hand, you wouldn't flick them with your fingers. You'd hit them with the, the strongest part of your hand, and that's the back of your left hand. And that's what I want the golf club sitting directly behind that. Now, the right hand is exactly the opposite. The right hand is the part that applies the hit. So I want to use the fingers of the right hand. Right across there. Now, why do I want to use the fingers? Well, if I were going to throw a ball, I wouldn't put it in the palm of my hand. I'd put it in the fingers of my hand, so I have something to snap it. So the combination of strength and hit are the two elements of the right and left hand put together straight on the golf club to produce a good grip. The most common fault of a golfer with a bad grip is his inability to be able to get a complete release and a full extension at the golf ball at the time of impact. Well, he thinks that he needs more strength within his grip, and he tries to take his left hand and turn it left, what we call a motorcycle grip. And he tries to take his right hand underneath the grip. He feels very strong at this position, but in fact, it's a weak position because one of two things are going to happen. One is that to keep the club face straight, he cannot release the club because he has to keep his hands forward and never really applies his power. Or two, if he does release his, his hands and the hands want to return to a normal position, the club face becomes closed, resulting in a duck hook. The other side of the coin is the grip that is too weak, resulting in an early release and a loss of power or if the hands are kept to the golf ball, results in an open face at impact. Remember, you want to keep your hands straight on the golf club so that you can apply the club face squarely on the ball in a square position at impact. It's just as though your hands were hanging to your side, brought together, separated, and closed. That's a good golf grip. The best golf shot in the world really doesn't make any difference if it isn't aimed at the target. I want to show you a simple way of how I go about lining up a golf shot, and I think it'll help you. Is it easier to line up a two-foot putt or a 40-foot putt? Well, obviously a two-foot putt. Likewise, I'm sure it's much easier to line up a tee shot from three feet than it is from 250 yards. For the purpose of this exercise, let's use this tee. Now, that's illegal to do that during a round of golf, but when, I'm, when I am playing a round of golf, I try to pick out a spot, whether it be an old tee or a piece of dirt or a divot or uh, some grass, something that's readily identifiable. And I try to draw a line from that spot back through the ball. So I'm sure you've seen me walk back behind a shot on television many times and, and do this. Where I'm, and what I'm really doing is I'm looking down the target line. I've picked a spot, I've got my ball, and I've got the target. And I try to draw a straight line between those all those three spots. So let's see, this tee here looks, well, it's pretty much on line with the target. So I'm back here, I'll look at it. I'll walk up to the ball. And what I try to do is I try to take a parallel stance with the line that I've drawn, this imaginary line that I've drawn back through the spot, the ball, and the target. Now, of course, when I draw, uh, take a, a parallel stance, I then can get the ball right off the right spot in my, uh, my feet. And of course, I do not want my lines Converging. In other words, I do not want my uh, uh, feet working to the right of the target or at the target. I want them parallel, not converging. So here we are. Parallel lines. We know the ball's in the proper place in the stance. I look up for comfort. 
and now I'm ready to hit it. Not too bad for an old man, huh? Tell me if you know this fella. He goes to the practice tee, hits the ball beautifully, stands up on the first tee, hits it 20 yards out in the trees, and spends the rest of the day changing his swing and his grip. When in fact, if he'd have gone through our little lesson here and picked out a spot three feet out in front of the ball on the practice tee, hit a few shots, getting adjusted to that, walking up to it on the first tee, picking out a spot and taking his parallel line, he would have been able to stand up on the first tee with confidence and down the middle and off to a good round and a lot of fun. The more things you can do right before you swing the golf club, the easier the game of golf becomes. Ball position is one of those fundamental elements that must be done correctly if you want to consistently hit good golf shots. I say the ball should be played off just inside the left heel. Why do I say that? Well, I think you have to understand the elements in the golf swing that make that happen. The first one is that the golf club travels on a path along the ground that as the body turns and the club comes back, it opens to the line of the target. It then comes back to the ball, and at one point during the swing, that club face is relatively square to the target, and then passes through and closes and moves off to the left. The second element in the golf swing is that the club comes up in the air as it comes on the back swing, and at one point in the swing, that club reaches the bottom of its arc, and just prior to the bottom of that arc is where you want to make impact with the golf ball. The club then continues on up again. So it's the convergence of those two elements which dictate where you want the golf ball played in your stance. And for most people, as you try to move to your left side, that position will occur just inside your left heel. The average golfer who places the ball improperly in his stance causes himself many problems. Let's just take, for example, the golfer plays the ball too far up in his stance. What does he do? Well, if he were corrected or dressed, he would be here. Well, now he's got to move up. He changes his shoulder, his head position, and his body angle. And resulting, his results are probably that he'll swing outside and down across the ball and hit down on it very sharply and not get a very pretty shot. Now, the golfer who plays the ball too far back in his stance, just the opposite problem happens for him. His body angle becomes too far back, his shoulders become closed, and he swings on a much lower plane back here, and he swings more up on the ball, and usually hits the ball high to the right. Or you might sometimes see the fellow who swings out over the top too. So he causes a multiple of problems, but it's all caused by the original position of being back behind the ball. Obviously, the correct position is off the left heel. To try to help yourself with off the left heel alignment, think in terms of having a perpendicular line to the line of your target or where your feet are going. Try to place that off the left heel, and if you can do that and think about it shot after shot, I think your chances of being consistent are certainly much greater. Hmm, how about that? I know a lot of golfers find what we've just been talking about pretty boring, but the hard fact is that grip, aim, posture, and ball position account for at least 80% of good shot making. Keep that in mind as we now get into the swing itself. Remember that what I'm going to show you next has to be based on solid pre-swing preparations if it's going to work effectively.
The single most important element in swinging a golf club is a steady head. Without a steady head, all the other fundamentals go out the window. Fortunately, the good Lord put my head right in the middle of my body, as he did with most of you. Let's try to leave it there when we address a golf ball and when we play a golf shot. As we stand up over a ball, if our head is in the center of our body and we bend over slightly in the waist and where the club hits the ground is our address position, that is where we want to leave the head. Now, at that point, I like to feel as though I have a stake driven down through my head, down through my body, and into the ground. And I rotate around that stake when I play a shot. It sets up a slight hip forward body angle, simply because my right hand grips down the club further than my left. And that body angle is in this position right here. Now I try to maintain that body angle and my head position throughout the golf swing. So as I turn, you notice that my body stays at the same angle and remains in that angle throughout the golf swing. Now, why is that important? Well, if I move my head off the ball, I now get into a position where my body angle is back here, behind the ball, and really dictates that the ball should be in a different position. Likewise, if I move my head forward, it does exactly the opposite on the other side of the ball. If I start with my head in the wrong position, then to get back into the right position, I have to move my head forward. And really, you don't want to be moving your head because you have just too many variables. So let's try to keep our head right in one spot and leave it there throughout the golf shot. Hmm. Most golfers don't even actually realize that they're moving their head when they make a golf swing. Good or bad, doesn't make any difference. Everybody has a tendency to move it a little bit. I think the average golfer, I'm sure you've seen him, He'll stand up to a ball, and he not only can move it back and forth, but he'll move it up and down. And he'll give it a little bit of a... And he'll say, oh, my gosh. He says, and he turns to his pro, and he says, hey, pro, what am I doing wrong? Well, the pro really doesn't have anything uh, to start with because he's thrown all the fundamentals out of the window by moving his head all over the place. Now, when I was growing up, I sort of I found a method of keeping my head still, or at least Jack Grout found a method. He used to grab my hair. It was a little bit painful, but uh, I learned to keep my head steady. And what Jack did was grab hold of my head, and I just hit shot after shot with him holding on to my hair. If you don't have somebody there to be able to hold on to your hair, I suggest that you practice with a shadow and have a shadow out in front of you, and you watch the shadow. And as you swing a golf shot, you watch and see that your head remains steady and doesn't go up and down or back and forth, because you can see that on your shadow. So let's, let's review a second here. What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to figure out a way to leave our head in the center of the body so the rest of the fundamentals of the golf swing are valid. And if you do that, you've got a good chance of playing some good golf shots. To play any sport, you should be lively on your feet. Golf is no exception. Foot action determines so many things within the golf swing that it's almost indescribable. Balance, timing, tempo, rhythm, all the things that are necessary in being able to do all the other things that you need to do in a golf swing. Your feet must remain lively and they must work. Now let me show you how Jack Grout taught foot action to me when I was a youngster. He started with the short golf clubs and he told me to roll my ankles, roll my left ankle in, roll my right ankle in, roll my left ankle in, roll my right ankle in. And as the clubs got longer, he then allowed the heels to start to leave the ground because he said he wanted to make sure that my hips remained level throughout the golf swing. So as the clubs got longer, I came a little bit off the ground with my left heel, a little bit off the ground with my right heel. Let me show you three golf clubs and three shots and how I think they should go with these clubs. This is a pitching wedge, and with a pitching wedge, my heels will pretty much remain on the ground. My, heel, my right heel will come off the ground just a bit at the finish. Now, with a five iron, you'll notice that my swing is a little bit longer, my stance is a little bit wider, and my heel will get pulled just slightly off the ground 
on the backswing, my left heel, and my right heel a little bit on the follow through. And now, with a driver, this is about as far as your heel should get pulled off the ground. Understanding foot action can be really a big help to you. The average golfer tries to make his feet either the dominant part of his swing or no part of his swing. Let me show you both of them. Here's the first guy who really thinks, boy, I said I'm going to make sure my feet work. Well, he's all over the place. The second guy, well, he doesn't understand foot action at all, but he's, gonna, he's heard that you want to make sure that your feet are planted well on the ground. Well, obviously, neither fella is the fellow that you want to describe when you're hitting a golf ball. The feet must be active, they must be lively, but they're not overactive and they're not still. They must react with the rest of your body and flow. Your, as your swing goes back, your feet are pulled back. As your feet go forward, your feet react with your body. That way, your timing, your balance, and everything else in the golf swing will happen together. How many times have you heard someone say, you're swinging too fast? Swing slower. When really what he's saying is that you're too tense and tension is the real culprit of a fast swing. A fast backswing is generally caused by tension at the start of the swing. Well, what do I mean by the start of the swing? Well, as I'm standing up over the golf ball, if I have tension anywhere in my body, that is generally caused, for most people, through the grip. If I'm tight with the grip, then my arms become tight, then my shoulders become tight, then my upper body becomes tight, and if I'm tight everywhere else, then my legs are tight. Now, really what I want to do is I want to be very loose with all parts of my body. I want to be very relaxed. I want to keep in constant motion until I'm getting ready to hit the ball. And I want to make sure that everything's relaxed so that I can start the club away from the ball very smoothly and very relaxed. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, I think if you have tension in your grip, then it transmits through the body. So I try to make sure that I grip the golf club just hard enough so that I don't have any tension in my forearms. If I start to have tension in my forearms, then I'm gripping the club too tightly. And at any point during the golf swing, if I start to feel tension in my forearms, then I've changed pressure and will not allow the golf club to release and I'll start to re be restricting my swing. That is obviously bad. So I want to make sure that I, that I do, what, do what I call soft forearms throughout the golf swing. That means that my grip is nice and loose, my forearms are soft, and what it does, it allows me to keep the tension out of my whole body and thus promote a slow takeaway and a smooth golf swing. It worked. The average golfer. Well, I've got my hands tight enough, I've got my arms tight enough, my legs are locked. Now I'm ready to go, but I'm so tight I can't move. And he jerks it away. The club head must swing. And of course, to swing it slowly, it has to be without tension. So I see a lot of average golfers and I say, okay, keep yourself constantly in motion and feel as though the head of the golf club weighs a ton. And you just sort of, with all your effort, you're relaxed and then the, you sort of pull it away and let it swing away. And if you can do that, I think that you can get it away with a nice smooth effort and get a nice release and swing without tension. So remember, if you take the tension out of your grip, it'll take the tension out of your body. If you can keep in constant motion, you have a good chance of making a nice, smooth golf swing.
How's that? Once you start the backswing, make sure you complete it. For without a complete backswing, you lose your potential for power and accuracy. Through a great majority of the rounds of golf that I've played in my golfing career, one thought has really dominated my thinking, and that is complete the backswing. Why do I want to complete the backswing? Why is it so important? Well, there are two elements in the golf swing which we're all trying to achieve and that's power and accuracy. And if we complete the backswing, we have a chance to deliver both of these simultaneously at the golf ball at the time of impact. First of all, power. Power is gathered by a turning of the body, a turning of the upper body and the lower body, and a completion of, of the backswing with a club going to a parallel position. At this point, the lower body uncoils first, bringing the upper body, my hands, the club, and the club head last behind it into the power position and delivering the power. Secondly, as far as delivering accuracy, I want to make sure that whatever line I take the club back on, I bring the club back approximately on the same line. So if I take the club, and for most shots, slightly inside, back to this point here, where it's again in the same position I was in the power position, I want to release it right from that same position, right back down the same line, so that I can have both my power and accuracy happen at the same time. There are probably as many ways not to complete the backswing as there are golfers. But let me demonstrate three that I think are very common. The first one, is the fella who doesn't use his body, doesn't use his hands. All he does is try to swing with his arms, and he swings. The second fella who tries to use his body, but he doesn't try to use his arms and tries, tries to use his hands a little bit. And that fella is sort of trying to hit the ball from here, and he doesn't, get any, he, he doesn't have anything, any power or accuracy. Now, the third fella who says, well, I'm going to complete my backswing, you know, I, he's going to do that, so he's going to not use anything but his hands. So he gets back, he says, okay, I've got it. He says, how about that? Well, obviously, none of those three are what you want to do. What you want to do is make sure that you use all the elements of the golf swing, and that is, we want to use our hands, we want to use our arms, and we want to use our body back and through. I frankly prefer that one. Something that may surprise you, but I firmly believe, is that it's impossible to release the club at the top of the downswing too soon as long as you move to your left side. First of all, let me explain to you what the downswing really is. It's the application of power and accuracy through the release of the golf club from the feet up. Okay, now let me explain those elements to you. The first movement that you make from the top of the swing is moving to the left side. That's by probably planting the left heel. You move to the left side, it re releases the lower part of your body, your upper part of your body, your arms, your hands, the club, and the club head is the last thing to really get going. Now, to get that complete release, you move and, and it generates the pull of everything here, and the club is pulled down into the hitting, hitting area. Now, do not try to keep your release from happening till this point, though. Because if you take this point and take that to the top of the swing, you'll see it was here, and the club has been released from there to there to get to this point. So as you start down, the club is released at the same time. So as long as you move to the left side, you go ahead and release the club so that you can get maximum extension 
at the point of impact. And that is important because that's what you're trying to achieve to get full power and accuracy at the moment of impact. Let me show you the two common faults that are made on the downswing. Not moving to the left side and not releasing at the top of the swing. First of all, let's take the fella who stands up to the ball and doesn't move to his left side, but releases from the top of the swing. What happens? Boom. It's what's called casting. And he looks when something like this. Now, let's take the second fella. And that fella is a fella who does not release the club at the top of the swing, and he holds on to it. And what he does is he takes a nice back swing here, he holds on to the club, which throws him outside, and that throws him out over across the ball, resulting in either a slice or a pulled hook. So let's see what happens there. That doesn't look very good either. Now, let's try to show you what should happen. First of all, you obviously want to complete the backswing. Swing the club slightly to the inside. At the top of the swing, at this point here, we move to the left side and release the club. And it should look something like this. I frankly prefer that one. follow through, I said it could be a great teaching aid. Well, how can it be a great teaching aid? It's all, the golf ball's already gone. Well, let me show you. The follow through is really a mirror of the backswing. In other words, if I'm followed through to here, if I draw that swing back, say, gee, that was the right position to be in here. If my follow through is over here, and I draw that back, all of a sudden I found I'm outside going back. Or if my follow through is out here, I draw that back, I now I'm too far inside. If, if, I, if I stand here and all my weight is on my right foot, I say, how did I get there? How did my weight end up on my right foot? Well, I mirror that. It's probably because I have my weight on my left foot on the backswing rather than my right foot. So there's a, many, many different things that you can pick up from this. Right from the chip shot, right through the driver. If a chip shot, you only take it back this far. You want to take it through only this far. An iron, you take it back this far. You want to take it through this far. A full iron back to this far, through this far. Right up to a driver, which you take all the way back here, and you mirror it here. Obviously, the balance on the back swings on the right foot. The balance on the follow through is on the left foot. It can be a great teaching aid if you just take the time to use it. There are three kinds of false follow-throughs that the average golfer does. First of all, the golfer who doesn't think the follow-through is important at all. Secondly, the golfer who thinks that, well, I'm on the first tee, I want to make sure it's nice and pretty. So what does he do? Pretty, but useless. The third fella, who thinks you hit the ball with a follow through? And what does he do? Well, he sort of, might, you might say, forgets to make a backswing. Again, useless. The follow through should be the mirror of the backswing. If you're going to make a backswing, it's only this far, it should only go through this far. They should be the same. So when you're going to take a full swing, you should take a full follow through. It should look something like this. Try it. I think it can be a great teaching aid to you too.
Oh, that went a long way. I bet you like to hit the ball a long way. Well, I do too. So let me show you the elements in my swing that I use to hit a ball a great distance. For me, and I think for most people, a correct grip creates power. Why does a correct grip create power? Well, it allows you to get a total release of the golf club at the golf ball. I try to take as wide an arc as I possibly can going, going back and wide an arc as I possibly can coming through. This gives me a very, very flat approach into the ball, and I hit it as much in the back of the ball as possible. Three, at the top of the swing, I am completely coiled. My legs are in a position to where they can really start to drive. My shoulders and upper body are turned. The club is in a full horizontal position. Now, from this point, I drive with my legs, release the golf club, uncoil my body, and release completely at the golf ball. All these elements help do the one thing that is necessary to create power, and that's make sure that this, the club head, moves fast. What happens to the average golfer when he wants to hit it 10 yards further? Well, the first thing he does is he gets all charged up, he gets all ready to really nail it, and he walks up to the ball. First thing he does, he gets a club and a death grip. Then as he's standing up over the ball, his arms lock up. Then his shoulders and upper body, and then his legs. And now he's really ready to hit it. And what does he do? He sw swings as fast as he can and hits it 40 yards offline. Well, obviously, that's not what you want to do. To hit a ball further, you must use all the elements in your golf swing to their fullest degree. What I mean is that you want to make sure that you take as long and full a swing and allow yourself to complete your backswing, allow your legs to work, and allow to get yourself time to get a complete release at the golf ball. And how do I go about doing that? Well, when I get ready to hit a golf shot, and I want to hit it a little bit further, I make a very conscious effort to be more relaxed and swing more slowly at the start of the swing and try to maintain that pace throughout the swing. After all, this, the club head, is what we want to move faster, not everything else. All the other things do is help that to move faster. So this is what I try to do. I walk up, I get nice and relaxed, make sure that everything is good and relaxed, and take as long and full a swing as I possibly can, but with a conscious effort to remain slower. And that was a long hit. So much for the basic components of the swing. Obviously, a big part of the game is bringing them all together in a smooth, powerful, and repetitive action. And that's what we'll look at now. We've slowed my swing right down so that you can really see what happens. And we'll also stop it momentarily for the maximum emphasis of key fundamentals. Okay, let's go. Very little tension at address. Then everything starts together on the backswing. Nice and smooth and unhurried especially when you're going for a big one. My chin swivels to make room for a big upper body turn, but my head stays very steady. Left arm straight, but not stiff. Shoulders and hips coiling fully around a fixed axis. As the wrists are cocked by the weight of the club head, the hands are well under the shaft, supporting it fully all the way to the top. Notice how the back of the left hand and the angle of the club face remain constant, which means both are staying correctly square to the arc of the swing. Here's another good look at how the shoulders and hips turn together to their maximum coil at the top of the swing, the main source of power in the golf swing. Club head very low to the ground as it starts back with the wrists cocking naturally and only in response to the weight and momentum of the club head. Notice the angles of the swing. My upper body and the club are at almost 90 degrees to each other at address, and they stay pretty much that way 
throughout the backswing. In other words, the plane of my swing remains perpendicular to the angle at which my upper body is inclined over the ball, which is exactly as it should be. No forward or up or down head movement as the downswing progresses. My head stays exactly where it was at address until well past impact. As soon as I'm moving to my left side, I begin releasing the club with my hands and wrists to be sure of achieving full extension at impact. The lowness of my right shoulder, hip and heel through impact show I'm staying down properly on the shot that I'm swinging under and not around myself. I watch the ball very closely, even when it's vanished. In fact, my eyes and head don't move until they're pulled around by the momentum of the follow through. Notice the full stretch of the left side approaching impact and on into the finish, indicating a complete release at impact, your number one goal on all normal golf shots. I like what I see here. Head back and down until well beyond impact. Hands supporting the club, body well balanced, indicating good rhythm and tempo. Notice again how the feet and legs initiate the change of direction and how everything else follows their lead in the early stages of the downswing. But at the same time, you have to get that club head moving if you want to hit the golf ball hard and true. You must release immediately as you move to your left side. Notice how my left heel gradually rises as my weight shifts to my flexed and braced right leg, allowing me to turn fully with my hips remaining level. Then I quickly replant my left heel, which shifts my weight back to my left side as the first move of the downswing. A good full body turn underway again here with the left shoulder and knee well behind the ball at the top and the shaft pretty much parallel with the ground. Then as I start down, notice the quietness of the club. No jerks or bobbles. This allows it to properly mirror its backswing path through impact and beyond. Notice how as they naturally follow the body turn, my hands in the club swing progressively more and more to the inside of the target line right from the start. This produces a fairly deep position of my hands at the top, which sets up the club head delivery from the inside. That's absolutely vital if you want to play this game well. As I reach the top, the club shaft is correctly at 90 degrees to my shoulders, which because of my big turn, angles the club a little to the right of the target. Then watch how the body uncoils, with everything working from the ground up. Again, this is essential to hit from the inside. Watch the foot and leg action again, because it's the key to a very full turn while keeping the swing centered and well balanced. Even before the club head's gotten all the way back, you'll notice I've replanted my left heel and I'm beginning to push off my right instep. You can really see here how golf's played from the insides of the feet. Left knee pulled well behind the ball as the right leg remains a solid brace for the body's coiling action. This allows me to make a quick transfer of weight to the left side coming down, which pulls everything else around in sequence. Hips, then shoulders, then arms, then hands, and finally, the club head. Here again, you see how everything starts back together, with the hands in the club immediately swinging to the inside in response to the turning of the body. Then note how the club is released right from the top, allowing me to deliver it along that same inside path and also to reach full extension left arm and shaft in a straight line at impact. Notice how freely my left leg moves as my body coils. There's hardly any weight on this leg at the top, which is a big factor in making a full body turn. Notice too, 
how the right shoulder and hip are still behind and beneath the left shoulder and hip at impact. Another sign of complete club head release. From overhead now, watch how the club face gradually opens relative to the target line, but remains constantly square to the turning upper body. Then coming down, these actions are reversed until the club head arrives momentarily square at impact, then closes again as it swings into the natural follow through. All perfectly responsive to the rotation of the body with no manipulation by the hands, wrists, or arms. This time, watch the path of the swing, the arc of the club head. As everything begins to turn away from the target altogether, right from the start, the club head swings progressively more and more to the inside, in sync with the coiling of the shoulders. Then with the legs leading and a full release, the club head returns to the ball along the same inside path until at impact, it travels momentarily straight along the target line. Then once again, it swings to the inside on the follow through. Watch the body action this time. Notice particularly how I'm turning my body and swinging my arms in the club always around a fixed axis. The back of my neck, the top of my spine stays centered from the start to finish, just like the hub of a wheel. If there's one fundamental common to all good golfers, this is it the ability to stay centered to swing every time around a fixed axis. Here's a look at the driver swing from four different angles simultaneously. Notice how golf is very definitely played from the feet up, not from the head down. My feet are the first thing to finish the backswing and the club head is the last. Then coming down, that sequence is simply reversed. The feet work first, followed by the legs, hips, shoulders, arms, hands, and finally the club head. Just about every sport calls for lively feet, and golf is no exception. These are actually four different golf swings, but notice how consistent my tempo is. I try for a comfortable pace and rhythm, not too fast and not too slow. Most of all, though, I try to keep the tempo constant on every swing I make with every club in the bag, whether I'm on the practice tee, or coming down the stretch with a chance of winning. Notice how I'm hitting the ball with the head of the club, not with my arms, not with my shoulders, not with any part of my body, but with a weight at the end of the stick with a club head. Always remember that you can get distance only from club head speed, never from body force. So go ahead and really use that club head. Here I am with a five iron, and it's exactly the same golf swing, except that the shorter shaft automatically brings me a little closer to the ball, inclines my body a bit more, and produces a slightly less full backswing. Otherwise, no changes from the driver swing in mechanics, tempo, or any other element. And this applies, of course, with every club in the bag for all normal shots. Looking down the target line, and again you can see I'm a little closer to the ball and more inclined from the hips due to the shorter shaft. Other than that, though, I'm swinging exactly the same as I did with the driver, except on a slightly reduced scale. If there's a secret to winning golf, it's repeatability, which is why every good golfer strives to build one solid, fundamentally good golf swing. Notice the fundamentals still at work here, swinging as always around a fixed axis, and once again being sure to get a good proportion of my weight onto my right foot on the backswing. If you don't shift your weight away from the target going back, there's no way you can properly transfer it towards the target coming down, which will always cost you distance and accuracy. I try to keep myself as free of tension as possible throughout the entire swing with every club, and particularly in my hands and forearms. Get too tight in the hands and forearms and the tension will flow from there to the rest of your body. A good golf swing is one continuous flow of motion, and the more tense you are, the less smoothly and fluidly the motion can flow. Now down to the wedge, and again notice that nothing basically changes except distance from the ball, the angle of body inclination, 
and the progressively smaller scale of the swing, all created by the shorter shaft and the decreasing need for power as opposed to accuracy. The fundamentals are still there, coiling and uncoiling around a fixed axis, a nice smooth weight shift back and then forward, and full releasing of the club for maximum extension at impact. You'll notice as I swing through the ball here that the divot is pretty shallow, even though the short shafted club makes for a much steeper or more upright swing path. That's because I'm still coming into the ball from the inside, which lets me release fully, which in turn delivers the club head along a relatively shallow arc through impact. And believe me, hitting from the inside is an absolute basic of good golf, whatever club you are using. Notice again here, even when power isn't important and the whole action has been scaled right down for maximum precision, how golf is still played very much from the ground up. Wedge, driver, or anything in between, you must be lively on your feet. Must use your lower half properly if you want to hit consistently good golf shots. Fortunately, Jack Grout taught me that lesson at a very young age, and it's been a huge help to me ever since. The wedge from overhead. And again, it's the same basic golf swing, the same mechanics, the same tempo, the same effort to meet the ball squarely from the inside with full extension at impact. And now, as I make what looks like a well-balanced follow-through here, I'm going to quit talking and simply let the action flow for a few more minutes so you can look at it in relation to your game and pick up whatever pointers you might feel to be most helpful to you. Okay, here we go. Reversing ourselves back through the wedge, and then the five iron, and finally the driver.
golf might be a lot easier if there was no wind and no slopes, but it'd also be a pretty dull game. The natural challenges it offers are a big part of its appeal, but to fully meet them, you have to know a lot more than one basic golf shot. So let's look at what really separates the men from the boys in this game, controlling the flight of the ball. The most frequently hit shot in golf is the slicer fade. It may surprise you to know, for the greatest part of my professional career, my favorite shot was the fade. Why did I hit a fade most of my career? Well, first of all, the straight shot is not only the hardest shot to hit in the game of golf, but the only time it'll go at the target is when you hit it. Otherwise, it's gonna be moving away from the target when, with a hook or a slice. So let's understand that to play a fade, and you aim the ball to the left of the target, you're going to be moving the ball to the target, just likewise with a hook, you move the ball to the target. Now, to hit a fade, all that I do is instead of having the club face square at address, I open the club face slightly at address, and then I aim slightly to the left of the target. This will move the ball down the left side of the fairway and back in. I can do it the same with a driver. I aim down the left side of the fairway and move it in, or, the, or hitting into a green to the left side of the green, moving into the hole. And here we are. Down to the left, slightly open club face, and make a normal swing. Should produce a nice little left to right fade. Now, how much do you open the club face? Well, that's a matter of personal preference, and the only way you can find out is for you to get on the practice tee and experiment a little bit for yourself. The average golfer tries to aim the ball down the center of the fairway. At that point, knowing he is a slicer, he tries to swing out over the ball and tries to guide the ball into the fairway, thus losing power and direction, like this. He'll hit a big old slice or he'll pull the ball, or he'll do anything, but he won't hit it very far and he won't hit it very straight. Now, really, I don't mind a fella being slightly outside. If he's gonna play a little, little slice, that doesn't bother me too much. But let's aim down the left side of the fairway, like this, and the fella feels like he has to swing a little bit to the inside to control the golf ball. So let's just open the club face slightly, aim down the left side of the fairway, try to swing from the inside so we'll retain our power and our slightly left to right shot for direction. He's gonna have more power, he's gonna have better direction. Now let's remember, to retain your power, you wanna use the same swing for all golf shots, including the fade. Let's just aim the ball to the left and have a slightly open club face to give you the tendency to fade the ball. How much you fade it is a matter of experiment, which only you will learn by practice. If you want a little more distance and still control the golf ball, you should learn how to play a draw. To hit a draw, I think you should first understand what produces a draw. A draw is produced not by coming in to the ball with a square club face, but by coming into the ball with a closed club face. So the club face turned in at impact. Now, I don't want to change my golf swing to play a draw. What I want to do is make exactly the same golf swing that I made with every other golf shot, but by the turning of the club face in, I will take loft off the club and produce a little extra distance, produce a spin that will make the ball go to the left, and to compensate for that, I aim slightly to the right of the target. And depending on how much I want to draw the ball is how much I aim to the right of the target and how far I turn the club face in. Well, what should that do? Well, as you look down the line of the target, that should make the ball go left. So let's aim to the right of the target to compensate for the closed club face. Now, all I want to do from there is make a complete golf swing. And this is what should happen. Not bad.
how does the average golfer go about hitting a draw? Well, he's been taught to first of all move his left hand over here, move his right hand under here, okay? Now, he's gonna close his stance, he's gonna bring his right foot back. Well, now he's gotta take the club to the inside, which he pulls it back in here, and then he's gotta make sure as he goes through the ball, he's gotta roll his wrists over to close the club face, and it looks something like this. Oh boy, wasn't that a nice pretty little draw? Let me see you do it again. <laughs> well, obviously he can't because he has too many inconsistencies and he hasn't used his basic golf swing and the one that he's used to. To play a draw properly, when you're on the practice range, let's say you decide to close your club face a little bit and you aim a little bit to the right of the target and it produces a five yard draw, fine. We'll close a little bit more and see if it produces a 10 yard draw. Now, you'll notice that when you close the club face and aim to the right of the target, you'll also get a little bit more distance out of the shot. So if you're playing a five iron distance, many times you can play that with a six iron because it produces more distance. Or if you have a four iron shot, you can take the five iron and get the extra distance that you need. And it should look something like this. Aim slightly to the right of the target, close the club face slightly, and make a normal swing. I hope a draw helps your golf game. Hitting the ball high. It's really not that difficult to do if you understand the principles, and it can really be a lot of fun. I think probably the, the most enjoyable and satisfying shot I can play in golf is when I'm behind a tree or an obstacle in trouble, and I'm able to get the ball up quickly and fly it to the green, particularly with a long iron. I have here a one iron in my hand, and let me show you how I go about hitting the ball up in the air. First of all, I'm gonna use the same golf swing that I use with every other golf club. Let's just take that as a given. Secondly, I'm gonna open the club face to put loft on the club. Well, you say, well, that's gonna make the ball slice. It is if I place it off my left heel. If I move the ball up in my stance, then the club will come square later in the swing also, by moving it up my stance, I'll catch it a little bit more on the upswing, which will allow me to stay behind the ball and should throw the ball up in the air. Let me show you. Well, you might say, that'll also make the ball go shorter. Well, it does. So when you're hitting up over an obstacle, you probably need one more club to play that high shot. But also remember, when you're playing downwind is the other reason you're gonna play a high shot, to stop the ball quickly on the green. So that the wind will compensate and give you the extra distance you need and the high shot will stop the ball quickly. Most average golfers think to hit a high shot that you must remain behind the ball and also help it into the air by a good full release. Well, they're absolutely right. But the way they do it is that they leave the ball at the same place in their stance. They get behind the ball by going back to the right foot and then staying there and releasing from the top of the swing, which is casting. Something like this. Of course, they always finish the swing. Well, obviously, what's happened there is that the average golfer has lost power because he stayed behind the ball too long. He stayed on his right foot. He's casted his swing because he didn't move to his left side. What he should have done was move the ball up in his stance, opened his club face slightly. This keeps him behind the ball by moving the ball up. It also puts the loft on the club to get it, get it up in the air. He was right, he must release it. But he moves to the left side so he gets his power too. Something like this. You can do that too. 
Just give it a little bit of a try. When playing in the wind, it really makes the game a lot more fun if you understand why and how to play low shots. The obvious reason that people like to hit low shots in the wind is that they want to keep the ball down out of the wind so they can keep control of it. Well, there are two kinds of wind shots. First, and the one is probably most commonly played, is the one where a fellow moves the ball back in his stance and closes the club face. Now, what does that do? Well, number one, by moving the ball back in the stance, it means we're going to get a little bit more on the downswing. Number two, we've closed the club face that takes loft off the golf club, which means we should hit it further into the wind. And three, it's a good position to be in because we come square a little earlier in the swing. It should produce a shot that looks something like this. Now, the second method of hitting a ball low comes from hit, taking exactly the same swing that you'd normally take with any other shot. All you do is reduce the length of the golf club and take a longer club, meaning if you have an eight iron shot, maybe take a six iron and go down the shaft four or five inches and do exactly the same thing you would with any other golf shot. What does this do? Well, it, having less loft will keep it lower. The shorter shaft will make it go shorter and you're not really hitting the ball quite as hard because you don't have as long a shaft and you're going to produce less spin which will throw the ball or keep the ball lower in the, in the air. So here we are. Right here, normal swing. Both are very useful. The average golfer not enough club in his hand and hits it too hard in the wind. What does it do? The ball goes out low, shoots up in the air, ends up 20 yards short of the target. Well, what he really wanted to do was use a combination of the two things I just talked about, the two lessons. One, you move the ball back in your stance, close the club face. Two, go down on the shaft. If you have a long iron shot, let's say a one or a two iron, and you move the ball back in your stance, you're not going to put a lot of spin on the ball, so you don't have to worry about shooting up in the air. And by closing the club face, you're going to put a slight draw on it, which will also help keep the ball down. As the shot gets shorter, the club lengths should vary. In other words, if I've got a five iron shot, I should be using a three or four iron going down the shaft. As I go to an eight, eight iron, I need a six iron to go down the shaft. As I get up to the nine or the wedge, I take even a seven or an eight and go way down the shaft to take the spin off the golf ball and to be able to control it. I've got a six iron here. I'm going to play an eight iron distance shot. And when you do that, you have to have a lot more fun playing in the wind because you're going to control the golf ball. You know, golf isn't always played from tees and level lies. Sometimes we get an uphill lie, and that can be a lot of trouble. Let me show you how I play it. An uphill lie can be a very awkward shot. So to try and play the shot, I try to make sure that I do as many things with my body, the club, and my swing that will simulate being on a level lie. First of all, being on, on an uphill lie will put more loft on the golf club. So if I've got a seven iron shot, why not play it with a five iron and just make it seven iron length? Now all of a sudden I've got the right length and the right loft for the distance I want to go. Secondly, I really try to use the same golf swing and I want to place the ball pretty much the same place in the stance. But I'm going to try to shift my weight so that uh, I can make the things happen at the right time. Meaning, if I move my hips a little bit forward, that sets the weight a little bit more towards my left foot and making it easier for me to get off my right foot. I'm going to keep the weight and my hips up there a little bit. To help that, I'm also going to take the angle of my body and try to get it perpendicular to the slope. So that sets myself here with my hips up here, which should allow me to come fairly level into the ball. OK, let's see what happens.
Worked all right there. The average golfer tries to play an uphill shot in one of two ways. Usually, he will try to make sure that he gets the ball first. He tries to get his weight up on his left foot. So he moves way up here on his left side, and he hits. And what does he do is he just drives the club into the ground, and the ball never really gets up or goes anywhere. The second method that the average golfer tries, he says, well, I want to make sure I get the ball up off the hill. So he gets his weight way back on his right foot, so he stays well behind the ball. And then he hits, stays right there, and he hits it from there. And what does he do? He hits it straight up in the air and doesn't get any power. Well, obviously, the combination of the two is what we're trying to get to. He wants to get his weight forward so he can get his weight to his left side. We do that by shifting our weight to our left side here. We're going to get behind the ball so we swing level the hill by changing our body angle. So let's do that again. Hips forward, body angle back, swing the length of the hill with a club that will simulate the distance you're trying to go. Instead of a seven iron, let's use a five iron and choke it down to a seven iron length. We then are free to play the shot. I hope that helps you play a few uphill shots the next time you're on the course. For most people, the downhill eye is the most difficult and awkward shot that they play in the game of golf. Let me show you how I play it. The downhill shot is a difficult and awkward shot for a variety of reasons. The main reason being is that you're going to have a shot where you're going to be reducing the loft off of the golf club, meaning you're going to have to take a shorter club to play the shot, and you don't have the luxury of being able to lengthen the golf club. So what do you do? Well, you try to create as many things as possible to be able to compensate for that factor and still get the ball into the air. First of all, I'm going to try to make my body angle fit the hillside. I'm going to try to move my hips back and most of my weight back to my right foot at the address. What does this do? Well, by putting my body angle perpendicular to the hill, I'll then be able to swing as normal as possible and on the line of the hill. My hips being back will keep me from getting my weight too fast to my left side and not allowing for a full release. The other compensation is that I'm going to put slightly more loft on the golf club by opening the golf club face and then aiming to the left of the target to compensate for that fade. Should look something like this. I know this is a complicated lesson, but the problem in playing a downhill shot is to get the ball in the air. The average golfer will try two ways of getting the ball in the air. One, he tries to get behind it. And what happens? Well, he hits about eight inches behind it. The second thing he tries to do, he says, well, he says, I don't want to hit behind it. I want to make sure I get the ball first, so he leans all his weight down on his left foot, and then he hits it. Yeah, he might catch the ball solidly, but he drives it right on into the ground. Doesn't get any elevation, he can't get a result out of the shot. So let me review a little bit of the things we're going to try to do to get the ball in the air. And that's the important thing on a downhill shot. One, we're going to open the club face slightly. That puts more loft on the club. We're going to take more club, then you might normally want to compensate for the downhill lie. We're going to open our stance slightly to al allow us to play a slight fade because of the open club face. We're going to get our body angle perpendicular to the hill, and we're going to get the majority of our weight centered back so we don't get to the left foot too fast. So let's watch that again. Here we are left, open club face, body angle and a normal swing. I hope that helps you the next time you get in this awkward position.
the side hill lie with the ball above your feet. A lot of people have trouble with it simply because they don't understand it. Let me explain it to you. When the ball is above the feet in a golf shot, the angle of the plane must change to conform with the side of the hill. What I mean by that is, if your normal plane would be here for a level lie, that would put the toe of the club into the side of the hill. So you really must conform the sole of the club to the side of the hill and swing on that plane. To do that, you need a slightly more erect body angle. You need to try and keep your head as still as possible. To do that, the natural tendency is to fall back down the hill because you're on the side of it. It's to keep more weight on your toe, toes. And also, the club, as it swings, will produce a natural hook because the club face will be coming in at a different angle and will naturally throw the ball off of the flat side hill lie to the left. So we aim to the right of the target to compensate. Everything else is the same. Ball to the right of the target, slightly more erect, weight slightly on my toes, and a normal swing. Hopefully, we'll get the right results. When the average golfer is confronted with a side hill lie, the ball above his feet, he'll generally make one of two mistakes. The first common mistake is he'll try to play it as though he were on a level surface or a flat lie. And what happens, he'll get the toe of the club caught into the hillside something like that, and the ball might go anywhere. Now, the second fella, he understands that he might get the toe of the club caught in the hillside, so he stands a little bit more erect to compensate for that. But as he stands more erect, he forgets a little bit about his balance, and all of a sudden, he's standing there and hitting it like this. He falls right back down the hillside. Well. Obviously, a combination of those two is what you're looking for. You're looking to keep your weight into the hillside. You're looking to keep a slightly more erect posture to be able to fit the plane of the swing to the side of the hill. And remember that because you're on the side of the hill, the ball will probably hook. So you need to aim slightly to the right of the target to allow for the hook. Then you just go ahead and make a normal golf swing. Try it my way. The side hill lie with a ball below your feet is one of the most difficult shots in the game of golf. Let me show you why and what to do about it. First of all, if I were playing a shot with a ball above my feet, I could take the club and allow the sole of the club to fit the contour of the hill by moving up the hill. But with the ball below my feet, as I move the club up the hill to let the sole fit the contour of the hill, all of a sudden there's a point where I can only go so far and the heel then gets in the way. So what I try to do to compensate for this is I try to keep as much weight as I possibly can on my heels and my middle body back as far as I can. This allows me to, to keep from falling down the hill. It also allows me to keep my head steady, which is going to have a natural tendency to fall out over the hill. And it allows me to bend my upper body to help fit the contour of the hill a little easier. Now, as I bend over, I also find but if I look down at the club, the angle of the face of the club is going to want to come in at a, such an angle to, as to produce a slice. So I should aim to the left of the target and just allow it naturally to happen. This is where I get the extra help that I've needed in that by moving around on the hill, I'll be able to come up the hill with my swing a little bit more, and this will allow me to avoid as much as possible catching the heel of the club in the ground. So here's what it looks like. Weight back on the heels, 
then over at the body, aim to the left of the target, keeping my weight back on my heels, keeping my head steady, and then a normal golf swing. Weight back on the heels, then over at the body, aim to the left of the target, and then a normal golf swing. Produces a little fade, and hopefully goes somewhere near the target. When the average golfer plays a side hill lie with a ball below his feet, he generally finds himself losing his balance and hitting the heel of the club into the ground, and the result is a bad shot, something like this. What I try to do is to fight all the natural tendencies and maintain good balance. I do that by keeping the weight on my heels, bending over from the waist, and trying as hard as I can to keep my head still. I aim to the left of the target to allow for the natural tendency for the ball to slice, and then I try to swing normally. I hope that helps you with one of the most difficult shots in the game of golf. Practicing. It's a waste of time, unless you know how to practice or why you are doing it. I practice for three different reasons. The first is to warm up for a golf round. I might hit 15, 20, 25 shots, starting with a pitching wedge representing a short club, the short iron with the eight iron, the middle iron, five iron, long iron, a two iron, and probably a driver, and then finish off with a few pitch shots. Now the average golfer, he finishes work at four o'clock, he goes to the golf course, the buddies are saying, come on, let's get to the first tee. What does he do? He rushes to the first tee, he picks up a club, he hits it down the fairway, and he chases it around nine holes of golf. What does he hit? Maybe 15, 20, 25 shots in nine holes of golf. He's all warmed up, and then he goes in and has a drink. Well, obviously, it only takes about five minutes to warm up for a round of golf. So it doesn't take very long to go out there and just hit those few shots. And I think that's very, very important to understand what kind of swing you're going to use that day. Second method is when I'm not sure what I'm doing or I'm having a fault in my swing, then I go out and I start off trying to figure out what that fault is, but I start off with the basic fundamentals. I start with my grip, I start with my stance, I start with my posture, my ball position. Nine chances out of 10, it's a basic fundamental that has caused my problems, not something I'm really doing in my swing. My swing is not really going to change. The third method of practicing is when I'm trying to really groove a certain thing in my swing and make sure that what I'm doing is right. Now, I do this a lot after I play a round of golf, whether I've played good or bad, but particularly even if I'm playing well, I go out and I'll hit a few shots, making sure that I understand that what I'm doing is right and I understand why I'm doing it. And I don't go out there and hit 500 balls. I might go out and hit 15 shots, I might go out and hit 50 shots, I might hit five shots. When I understand it, I've practiced with a purpose and I get away from it. Whew. You ever seen that guy in the practice tee? I'm sure you probably have. Well, he's getting exercise, not practice. And when I go to the practice tee, I want to try to accomplish something. I want to practice with a purpose. And when I say practice with a purpose, I want to practice as though I'm playing a shot on a golf course. After all, that's where I'm going to use the shot. So let's think about how we're going to practice. Well, how are we going to approach a ball? I approach the ball from the rear. I come up to it. I've picked out a spot in front of me. I line up down the line of the target. I take my time and make a nice smooth swing and try to remain on balance. Now I'm accomplishing something here. Whether I'm warming up for the round, whether I'm correcting a fault, or whether I'm grooving my swing, I'm trying to accomplish something when I practice.
Want to lower your scores without rebuilding your swing? Devote some extra practice time to the short game, and I promise you that will happen. The reason, of course, is that these are the scoring shots, the stroke savers, the area where you can most easily recover from previous mistakes, where your goal should always be to turn three strokes into two or two into one. Let me show you how I go about doing that. The 50 to 60 yard pitch shot, medium length shot. A shot we all frequently have to play, and I'm afraid we're not as good at it as we should be. Let me show you how I play it. First of all, I play the middle length pitch shot with a sand wedge. As a matter of fact, I play all pitch shots with a sand wedge, as do most of the pros on the tour. Secondly, I want to make sure that I'm as ag aggressive as I can possibly be with this shot to be able to get as much control on the golf ball, either through spin or through hitting a soft shot into the green. Now, how do I go about being aggressive? Well, I want to make sure that I'm hitting the ball as hard as I can at the bottom and not make it go a great distance, maybe just 50 or 60 yards. Well, if I would hold the club at the end, the ball is going to go a great distance. If I go down the club or down the shaft and reduce the length of the shaft of the club, thus reducing the length of the club, I should hit a shorter shot, even if I hit it with the same power. If I reduce my arm swing from there to here and play the shot with more hands, I'll again not hit the ball as far, but I'll still be able to hit it hard. So let's see how I go about playing the shot. I use a fairly narrow stance to keep my, my feet nice and loose and being able to be very fluid so that I can be very quick on my feet to be aggressive. Next, I play the ball off my left heel. My head is pretty much over the top of the ball. I grip the club shorter. I make sure I play the shot with a lot of hands, and I'm trying to be very aggressive. Ooh, that was close. I think if you try to play the shot aggressively, you'll find that you'll get a lot more control, and you'll enjoy playing this shot with much greater success. There are quite a few ways that the average golfer has trouble playing a middle length wedge shot. But I think the most common is that he takes too full a swing and eases off into the shot. Something like that, resulting in the inability to spin the ball or the inability to control the ball through being aggressive. What should he do? Well, first of all, he wants to get club head speed to get spin. So he needs to use his hands. Secondly, he doesn't want the ball to go very far, so he needs to reduce the length of the club by going down the shaft. This combination, along with quick feet and your head right over the ball, should produce a nice little crisp middle length wedge shot for better control. It's essential to know how to hit a short pitch shot around a green if you want to save strokes. One of the biggest misconceptions in the game of golf is that pitch shots are played with pitching wedges. Actually, 95% of the pros play 95% of the shots around the green with a sand wedge. Why do they do this? Well, let's take the design of the sand wedge. The sand wedge is designed so that the flange of the club hangs below the leading edge. So if you sit the club on the ground, you'll find that the only thing that hits the ground if the club is sitting in the position it was designed is the flange. The leading edge doesn't get into the ground. If the leading edge gets into the ground, then you'll dig on the shot, as you would if you would use a pitching wedge. Now, the second feature of a, of a sand wedge is the flange and the width of it. You see a lot of flanges that are very, very wide. I prefer a narrow flange because it gives me a lot more versatility in playing off of soft ground and hard ground. So now we figure out, well, how do we use this sandwich when we go to play a shot? 
Well, you want to use it as it is designed, meaning that here's the club sitting on the ground as you would find it sitting on the shelf. So I try to make contact with the golf ball as though it had never moved from this position. So that I take the handle of the club and I don't want it to pass the middle of my body until after I've made contact with the golf ball. Now to make this happen, I use a grip totally different than what I would with a, with a chip shot or with a regular shot. I take a stronger left hand and a weaker right hand, which allows me to be a little freer with the wrist and play with a little bit more hands. And I stand up the ball as I would with any other shot, ball off the left heel. My grip is in that handsy position, as I call it. And then I let the club head do the work and returning, not let the handle of the club pass the middle of my body until after impact, like this. It should help you with a lot of your shots around the green, too. The average golfer either has a shot coming into the green too hot or too soft. He really doesn't have any consistency on it. He either tries to play the ball back in his stance and drill the ball into the ground, or he tries to play the ball up in his stance and tries to lift it up on the green. Well, obviously, he's not going to be very consistent. So what he really wants to do is try to catch the ball at the bottom of the swing, and that's by placing the ball off the left heel and use a great deal of hands and returning the club to its original design position. And I think he'll find himself to be a lot more consistent with that type of shot. Does this shot scare you? Well, it really shouldn't. It's the only shot in golf you really don't have to hit the golf ball first. The sand shot is obviously played with a sand club. And the sand club is so designed that it will go down into the sand and out without going too deep because of the flange that hangs down on the golf club. This is the part that controls the depth of the shot. And the depth of a sand shot is far more important than how far you hit behind the ball. I really don't worry too much whether I hit an inch, two inches, three inches behind it, but I al always worry about how my hands are at impact. Now, let's take the address of the ball. Instead of having the ball off the left heel, I move the ball up into the instep of my left foot, which means it's maybe an inch and a half, two inches in front of my heel. But I still enter the sand approximately off my left heel. I have a grip that is similar as that, uh, with that of a pitch shot in that my left hand's over this way and my right hand is over this way. Club face is slightly open. I use a fairly wristy stroke, and I want to make sure that the handle of the club does not pass the middle of my body until after I've made contact with the sand and the ball. That's how I control how deep and how far behind the ball I hit. Something like this. So remember, you want the handle of the club not to pass the middle of your body so the club will perform as, as it is designed until after you've hit the sand and the golf ball. Give it a try. It might help your sand play. I think the real thing about a bunker shot for the average golfer is that he's terrified of the sand, and he really is afraid to go ahead and just play a nice, normal shot and let the club head do the work. The first guy, he tries to help it out of the sand, and he either hits the ball right in the middle and nails it across the green, or he hits it fat and doesn't get out of the bunker. The second fella, he thinks, well, if I take out enough sand, surely the ball's gonna come out too. So he stands here, and he's got a big old long swing and tries to drill the club through the sand. Well, really, to play a sand shot, it's a very delicate shot. You want to hit just a little bit behind the ball. You want to let the club head do the work. And the looser you hold the golf club, the better chance you have of letting the club head do the work. So you place the ball off the instep, 
Nice loose grip, hit it about twice as hard as you would for a normal shot, and let the club head do the work. I think your sand play is about to improve. Chipping. Its technique is a game in itself. First of all, let's try to figure out what we're trying to accomplish with a chip shot. Obviously, it's getting the ball close to the hole. But what club can you get the ball closest to the hole with, generally on the green? Well, obviously, the putter. So let's try to simulate a putt as much as possible. So the first thing we have to do is get the ball on the green. Well, I try to get the ball on the green with a chip shot as soon as possible say in the first three or four feet. Well, let's just take this shot, for instance, here. I've got a 40-foot shot, maybe six foot off the green, and I try to carry it three or, free, three or four feet on the green. That's maybe carrying it 10 feet and let the ball roll 30 feet. Well, for this shot, I've selected an eight iron. If I had a longer shot, maybe 60 feet, I might select a six iron. If I had a shorter shot, maybe 20 feet, I might try to carry it 10 feet and roll it 10 feet with maybe a pitching wedge or a sand wedge. Of course, a lot of it depends on the cut and the speed of the green, too. But that's how I select a club to try to simulate a putt and get the ball rolling as quickly as possible. Now, let's go to technique. The technique of hitting a chip shot is, first of all, in the grip. I want to try to make my hands be as much opposite each other as I possibly can in opposing each other. I use a reverse overlapping or a putting grip put my hands opposing them, turn my elbows out. This allows me to be in a position of not being able to use my wrist. Unlike pitching where you use a lot of hands, in chipping you want to take your hands out. I then make sure that the ball is placed in the back of my stance, somewhere near the right foot. And the worse lie I have, the more I play the ball back. And also, I want to make sure that the club angle, or the shaft angle, is ahead of the ball. And of course, the worse the lie, the more the shaft will be moving ahead of the ball. I take a relatively wide stance. Now I've got the ball placed in the back of the stance. My hands opposing each other. And from this point here, I've got everything locked. I just hit it with my shoulders. When I do this, I find I have a great deal of control over any chip shot. The most common problem of the average golfer is consistency of distance, not accuracy. He tries to help the ball too much and uses his hands too much. So I think if you use this method of taking your hands out of it, your shaft ahead, and hitting it with your shoulders, I think your chipping will improve greatly. Putting is no different than any other golf shot. Without a good setup, you haven't got a chance. There are three basic fundamentals in the setup for putting. First of all is the grip. With the grip, it be no different than any other golf shot. I want my hands opposing each other and, and opposite. I want the right hand, all four fingers, on the putting shaft, and my left hand has the index finger of my left hand overlapping the last finger of my right hand, and it's called the reverse overlap grip. This is used by 95% of the pros on the tour, and my thumbs are basically down the shaft. Now, that must be comfortable, too, so a little adjustment for comfort is fine. Secondly, your eye should be over the ball. Now. The most important part of over the ball is what I call down the line over the ball. It may be a little behind the ball, which is the way I putt, so I can see the line, or which is probably preferable in a way I wish I probably could have putted, is my eyes directly over the ball. That way I have converging lines and cross on the ball, and that will allow me to hit the ball right at the base of the stroke. With my method, I am slightly behind the ball 
so that I'm looking down it and the base of my stroke is a little bit before the ball, which means that I have to make an extra effort to carry my putter through the ball. The other important factor and fundamental is that your arms and your shoulders should always be on the line of the target, whether you use an open stance or the square stance with your eyes over the ball. Now, the reason I use that is because I must be comfortable. And putting is no different than any other shot. You have to be comfortable to be able to hit the shot properly. So here we are. Reverse overlapping grip. Eyes over the line of the target. Arms and shoulders down the line. And then it's just a matter of swinging the putter and hitting the putt. I hope it helps. When you go to the golf course, you see all kinds of golf swings. When you go to the putting green, <laughs> you might see anything. You see guys bent way over here, hands apart. You see guys putting on the side. You see guys standing straight up. And you see very few of them paying much attention to the fundamentals that should make you a good putter. Let's review. First of all, I want my hands opposing each other so that I can be as square to the line of the putt as possible. Secondly, I want to make sure that my eyes are down the line of the putt, whether they be over the ball or slightly behind it. It's a matter of preference. And third, I want to make sure that my shoulders and my arms are square to the line of the putt. If you follow these basic fundamentals, I think you've got a chance of being a pretty good putter. A good stroke is one that is repeated time after time after time. When we're putting, Consistency becomes the name of the game. Being able to strike the ball solidly time after time. And I think there are two elements that I think are very important in my stroke that could help you develop your stroke and be a better putter. First of all, is I try to make sure that I putt with my arms and shoulders. I generate my power from my arms and shoulders and I use my hands for direction only. Once I set my hands, I then allow the arms and shoulders to dictate how hard I'm going to hit the ball. Secondly, is that the pace of the stroke or the tempo of the stroke is developed by the swing of the putter, the weight of the putter swinging back and forth. In other words, if I have a short putt, I take a very short swing and I let the putter swing back for short. If I have a longer putt, it swings longer. But the weight of the putter dictates the pace of the stroke. I put those together and I should be more consistent. It should look something like this. Here I am over the ball, and I'm thinking, okay, I've got about a 12-foot putt, and I want to make sure that I swing with my arms and shoulders, and I want to swing the club back a reasonable distance so that I can swing it through with the weight of the putter and cause the ball to roll over slowly and evenly and stay on the ground and give myself a much better chance to be consistent to make all the putts that I need to make when it's important. I think the average golfer doesn't separate his hands and arms enough when he's putting. And what I mean by that is he tries to use both his hands and his arms for direction and for power. And what results is that they start acting independently and it sort of pulls the putter off the line and distorts the stroke. Now, this is what he might look like. And I'm sure you've seen that kind of a stroke. And I think you've heard about the yips. Well, those are the kind of things that happen when you're trying to do too much and try not to keep it simple. Now, the other kind of fault that you might see with the average golfer is that he quits at the ball. You see a lot of fellas who say, well, I'm going to take a big, long stroke. And then they stop at the ball. Well, obviously, you must be aggressive, and you can't stop the putter. So what I really feel you want to do is you want to let the weight of the putter take the putter back and have it back far enough so that when it arrives at the ball, it is arriving with its maximum force, and you'll be aggressive going through the ball. Secondly, 
You want to make sure that the putter is swung from the shoulders and arms and not with the hands and use the hands for direction only. That will keep the putter blade on line stroke after stroke. And after all, consistency is the name of the game. Here we are. Right down the line. Give it a try. The most fortunate thing ever to happen to me as a golfer was meeting an exceptional teacher almost as soon as I started playing. There have been some fine self-taught golfers over the years, but I believe most people will progress faster with sound instruction. My teacher throughout my entire career has been my good friend, Jack Grout, and I've invited him along to offer his thoughts on that and other aspects of this great game. When I was 10 years old, Jack, I remember my dad used to take me out to the golf course and. Uh, he remember he'd had his ankle operations and he had uh, needed a walk and he couldn't make a golf game. So he took me along and we sort of uh, walked and played one hole and uh, he'd play one hole, I'd carry the bag and then he'd have to rest about 20 minutes and I'd have to chip around the green. And we did this several times and finally one day he said, uh, uh, how would you like to learn something about the game of golf? And how would you like to take some lessons? And I said, well, I think that would be great. And of course, a very fortunate thing happened for me about that year, and that was the year that, uh, 1950, that you came to Scioto Country Club. I went over to your father's drugstore one evening, sometimes in February or March, and uh, your father recognized me, and he came to me and he said, uh, I understand you're going to have some, have a junior class lesson this year for the boys and girls. I said, that's right. I said, boys from 10 to 16. He said, well, I have a son 10 years old. I would love like for him to be in our in your class lessons and I said all he has to do is when school is out in June is I'm going to have a, have a couple of women up there to, to take the boys names and the girls names down and uh, and start the class lessons on a Friday at 10 at, at 10 o'clock and the first one there was you <laughs> <laughs> well Jack if you were going to start a junior class you know, like you did 33 years ago, uh, how do you start a youngster? How do you get him started? Well, the first, uh, first thing I do, Jack, is get the grip. That's the most important part of the swing. I'm positive of that. And be as plain as I could, I would say that if you walked into any, any uh, first tee in the, any golf course in the United States or America or all over, and you saw the first 100, 100 people hit a ball, 99 of them would have a poor grip. So I've always been concerned with the grip first. You sort of taught me to learn how to hit the ball a long way and learn how to control it later. Right. And I've sort of felt like that's, that was a pretty good policy, to teach a youngster to really learn how to have fun and go out and just pop it. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, as he gets a little bit older and he, he starts to think a little bit, little bit about trying to score, then you try to keep him on the golf course. Now, how did you do that with me? Well, I don't know. You just, uh, whatever I'd say, you would do. And I would uh, draw a comparison with, uh, with, with baseball pitchers. All great baseball pitchers had a fastball, which is power, speed. Lefty Grove, all the fellows that could really smoke that ball would turn out to be great pitchers. And they learned to throw the hard fastball first, hard ball first, then learn control. It's the same thing in golf. You learn to hit the ball far and then learn control. And... Uh, and I, and I still believe that's true, is to, to be able to hit the ball far and hit it high. And you were one of, the, one of the exceptions. I mean, you just hit the ball far right from the go, and you wanted to hit the ball far right from the go. And from there on, you learned control. Jack, you've had uh, a lot of the, the pros through the years, uh, uh, and a lot of the amateurs come to you. Uh, uh, you have, uh, I know Ray Floyd comes to you an awful lot. Uh, you have probably had 30 or 40 of the pros on the tour come to you from time to time. How do you handle them differently than, than you handle me, or what do you, what do you try to do with somebody when he comes to you? Well, all, all swings are different. You know when it's Jack. I mean, the, the, some of them are flat, some of them are upright, some are short, some are tall. But I usually take what they have, and then I try to uh, practice on what they're bad with. In other words, uh, uh, all these players come to me with good grips, or they wouldn't be there to be a, be a fine player. Now, some, some of the fellas, uh, 
possibly don't practice as much as they ought to. But I mean, I always try to help all the fellas. I've had a lot of, a lot of amateurs come to me that, that I'm, I'm sure that I've improved in time. Uh, some of the fellas are, as you know yourself, they're impossible. Oh, sure. So well, some people just can't play the game. That's well, you all. get uh, you get a lot of women come to you too, Jack. Yeah, a lot of I mean, a lot of pretty good women players. What do you do? What do you do with the women? Do the same things women do with men. I mean, but they, women don't have the strength that men have. They have the strength, but you can generate speed with full turning, uh, better understanding of, of the uh, of the inside movement, backswing, hit the ball from the inside. Well, you just you just struck on something right there that that I've always appreciated. Uh, you taught me, you said understanding. Uh, you always taught me to understand what I was doing with the golf swing, understand the moves of the golf swing, Un not only how to do it, but why to do it. And I think that that has probably been the greatest thing that you taught me is, is teaching somebody, you know, why you do something. And then they understand it completely. And if they can understand it, then they can become their own teacher. I remember Bobby Jones, uh, he sat down with my dad and I, and as a matter of fact, it was at Richmond in 1955. It was the first national amateur I qualified for. And Jones sat there and he said, he said, you know, uh, Mr. Nicholas, and he said, uh, and you, Jack, he says, he said, you know, he says, I was a good player when I was a youngster. And you know, because you knew Bob Jones and saw him grow up. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, but he said, I didn't become a great player until I learned how to correct myself on the golf course. And as I was playing around the golf, if uh, uh, I got myself in trouble, if I didn't know why I got myself in trouble, then I would have a bad round. And he said, you know, you've heard of Jones's eight lean years. He said, I went through those eight years and every time I had a problem, what do you go back? Was it Stuart Maiden? Stuart Maiden, yeah. Yeah, he used to go back to Stuart Maiden. He says, okay, Stuart, what did I do wrong? And Stuart would help him. And pretty soon he learned what to do. And that's what you did to me. You, you, I always ran back to you as a, as a kid. Every time I play a tournament, I'd come back and you'd say, come on, Jackie boy, let's go out there and hit some more. You'd have me playing 36 holes, hitting balls in the morning, hitting balls at noon, hitting balls at night. And, uh, but I wanted to do that. But, you, but each time we played, you made me learn something of why I was doing something and the mistakes I made. And uh, uh, I think that was the greatest thing you, you ever did for me because uh, uh, it allowed me to graduate from being dependent on you to being dependent on myself. Well, Jack, you know, you were, you were a, a, an exception to all rules of the game. Uh, what do they say? Some people are born to be great, and some people are, what, uh, what is it, uh, 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 learn to be great or whatever. But you had great ambitions. And you were, you were a strong lad, and you're wide awake, and you're a smart fella. You were smart when you were a kid. Uh, you wanted to learn the game. You did everything I asked you to do. I've seen you practice in, in wind storms that, uh, that a brave man wouldn't venture out there in. I've seen you, I, I, would, say, I would say to you, I said, Jack, if you were play in Scotland, you're gonna have to learn to play in the heavy winds, the hard winds. I've seen you practice in rain, I've seen you practice in snow, snow hail, whatever. And you didn't care, no. you just wanted to play golf. Well, I, got, I remember how many times in the wintertime at Scioto, we used to go down the first fairway and the snow would be on the ground and we'd take a shovel and a broom <laughs> <laughs> and we go, we go cover a flat spot off, and with you know, get the snow off of it, and we'd hit balls. Of course, you couldn't pick them up because you couldn't find them. You couldn't lose, lose them. Yeah. And we we just wait till the next snow, and uh, we we hit everybody's practice balls that were in the club, <laughs> and then we try to figure out a way to separate them in the springtime. <laughs> <laughs> and then that one year we put the half a Quonset hut up. Yeah. Well, that that, that was nice and warm on me. Oh, that was great. Yeah. I mean, we put this half a Quonset yeah. hut up here, yeah. and we put a heater back there, yeah. and we hit balls out in the snow all winter long. And you used up all my balls. I used up all your balls, all my <laughs> balls, and all everybody else's balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seemed like a long time ago, Jack. Jack, right, it was yeah, a long time ago. It was ago. great, and, uh, and I've always admired the way you and your family, and I've admired the way you've played, the handles yourself like everybody, everyone else, and, and you're a great champion. Thank you. Jack, you know, something that uh, you and I have done every year is that at the start of the winter season before I go on tour, you've always gotten me to come down and say, okay, you know, or at least I come down to you and I said, Jack, I'm a beginner. And you've started me out fresh. We start with the grip, the stance and everything. And, you know, why do you think that's a pretty good practice for most people? 
have to review the fundamentals of the of the game, the hands, the feet, and the stance, and posture, and everything. That means how good a player you are. It'll make any difference. You can get, you can fall into bad mistakes by just thinking about it. Sometimes laying off, say in the winter time, like people do. Um, Oh, you forget sometimes. You want to. You want to. You're you're thinking sometimes something different that might improve you. And a lot of people do that a lot of times. They want to get away with what they know better, and uh, they want they want to try something different. That's the main thing. Well, you know, from my standpoint too, Jack, I feel that coming to you early in the year, all those things happen. But also, it's a, it's at a time when I've had a layoff. Not only have I forgotten some of the good things, but I've forgotten a lot of my bad habits. Well, that's good to forget those. That's right. right. You f I forget my bad habits and forget the way I, maybe I was swinging some of the bad habits I had from the year before, and we try to start out fresh that year, and I started, boy, I said, let's put my hands on the club right. Let's get my feet sitting properly. Let's get my head postured properly on my body. Let's get the proper stance, the proper, all the things that you need to get started. I think that's right. great. Now, you know, you have, you have a lot of people that come to you, Jack, and, you know, I might be one who might be a fairly decent player, but you have a lot of people that come to you in the same way that are never going to be great players, but they're going to, but they enjoy playing the game of golf, and they want to have fun playing the game of golf. Uh, when you get a fellow who's never going to be better than a 7 or an 8, obviously he wants to be a, a scratch handicap, but he's never going to be a 7 or 8. How do you get him to uh, enjoy the game of golf, have fun, and accept what his limit limitations are uh, and to, to to go out and enjoy the game what, what do you try to tell him well I asked him first I said How, how's your game going what shall we work on today I said is your short game good or your long game good or I said what uh, what's happening to you out there now you're still a seven or eight handicapper you have good power you have pretty good swing what what happens out on the golf course with you so that's what you work on. That's what you work on. But you make him enjoy it. You want him to learn to enjoy it. That's right. And, and I examine his clubs and see if he has the proper uh, clubs in his bag, the shafts and everything, and uh, see his clubs are in good shape and go from there. How many people do you find that come to you have clubs that they can't play with? 60% at least. Yeah. Got the wrong clubs in their bag, wrong shaft. Uh, you take a, some fella that's... Uh, uh, I've, I've had pros come to me, big hitters, and they got a soft shaft in their bag. And I said, why do you have a soft shaft in your bag for? He said, I get more power. And I said, you don't need more power. You need to hit it straighter. Yeah. Learn to hit it straight down the fairway. That's where the, that's where the money is. You don't play out of the bushes. Getting back to this fellow that uh, comes to you and you work on the short game, uh, it seems to me then that what you're trying to do is, is, is if a fellow, let's say a seven or eight handicap, he should be a two or three handicap, or he's a 15 and should be a 10, and it's a short game, you're trying to eliminate the part of the game that he has trouble with so that he will enjoy all the game. And if he enjoys all the game, then he'll be satisfied with a great part of it and have a lot of fun with it. But if he has one part that he fears, in other words, I went for a long time where I really feared playing certain kinds of pitch shots. Like what? Well, the, the pitch shots over the bunker, you know, you know, you remember when I went to Phil back in 1980, and Phil helped me get the ball over the bunker. I don't have any fear of those shots anymore at all. And I used to hate missing a green because I feared a certain shot. Now I don't fear it, so I don't, I don't worry about missing the green. And as a result, you're going to hit more greens, you're going to hit more good shots, because you're not afraid of putting the ball in a place that you can't play. Jack, we've, we've talked about coming back at the beginning of the year and working on the fundamentals. Uh, I think I've been a fundamental player all my life. I've never worked on gimmicks too much and everything else. Uh, do you try to do this with everybody? Do you think that uh, uh, sometimes there are little things or gimmicks that people can have, or do you try to go back and, and, and take a fella and say, okay, you've got a bad grip, but I'm going to work with that bad grip and try to fit that to, a, to your game, or are you going to try to change the fella's grip? Are you going to try to change a fellow's stance if he's got a bad stance? What do you what do you what do you try to do? If, if if a person has a bad grip, I can't accept that, and I don't know how to work around a bad grip. Okay. Uh, if, if a man has a bad grip, I show him how to hold it, uh, hold the club the proper way, and I insist that he does that, and I'll I'll remind him every, every shot that he must must adhere to the proper grip. Okay. Let me ask you this question: Which mine's a grip? You know, a lot of youngsters start out and they have a very strong left hand. 
they think that's stronger when in actual truth it's weaker. Right. Uh, at, but they feel like, and women hold it strong with the left hand, um, or what they call strong by turning the left hand to the right. What, uh, at what age do you feel that a youngster usually is strong enough to start working with the right grip, or do you, would you prefer him to work from the right grip right from day one? No, no, when a boy or girl is about eight or ten years old, their hands aren't very strong. And I would insist for a while to have the left hand, right, left hand over so they can see two or three knuckles okay. for a while and turn the right hand under and uh, so they can get, hit inside and get some power on the shot. But uh, after, after a while, when they get a little bit taller and they get stronger, then I, uh, I insist that they use a proper grip. I insist on that. Now, uh, other than the grip, I, I always like to think that the shoulders must turn full. If I stand right angles to a person, say they're shooting uh, the ball north and I stand east, I, I insist that I must see the right shoulder blade on the backswing. That is a full turn. That's 90 degrees or better. That is correct, and you must be that position. Some people like to play with their hands all the time, just uh, move their arms and hands back and forth without any footwork at all or any turn of the hips and shoulders, and they'll never make a, good play, a great player. I'd always like to think that if a person's starting out, that every person can make a great player. Okay. They have possibilities of making a great player. And without these fundamentals, you can't make a great player out of a person. Give everybody the equal chance. That's can't what make, I can't try. Can't make a silk purse, can you? Nope. <laughs> can't do it. Well, Jack, uh, uh, you know I can't thank you enough for all the years that uh, you've helped me and given me in, in the game of golf. And uh, uh, yeah, I might have been a good pupil. But I had one hell of a teacher. Let me say this, Jack. In all due regards to, to, to whatever I've done. You've made a great teacher out of me. <laughs> well, that's a good partnership, Jay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Well, there we are. Golf my way. This marvelous game has given me tremendous enjoyment and fulfillment in my life, and it's always a pleasure to try to help other people get more fun and satisfaction from it. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and the very best of luck to you in all your golfing endeavors. <laughs>